Uh, Courage, what is your name and can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, hello. So my name is Natasha and my last name is Bacchus, but my preferred name is Courage. And so this is my sign name like this. Uh, and so a little bit about myself is I was born and raised in, uh, in Toronto, but my family is from Guyanese. So I grew up in a Guyanese uh, household. And my first language is American Sign Language. Uh, but American Sign Language is a colonized language for sure. But that was the first language that I had and how I expressed myself conversationally through my art and my athletics and with people from all over the world. So that's my first language is American Sign Language. As well, something about me is I used to be a deaf Olympian and I was a sprinter and uh, I was a three-time deaf Olympian and I'm a very competitive person. And I became an artist in about 2019 in a production called The Black Drum. And that was the first fully deaf cast in Toronto. Uh, and we also went to France to a uh, event there um, for theater performers, and we traveled around working with different artists using ASL and music and doing ASL monologues as well as ASL storytelling. So it was a blend of media exhibitions. <clears throat> And it was a uh, curated by Deaf Day Interpreting. Um, and so uh, they hosted a panel of deaf artists and advocates as well. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Can you share how you began your work in uh, theater? So in 2018, I joined uh, the Ontario Cultural Society for the Deaf. <clears throat> and this was my first experience, but it didn't really feel like the safest of spaces for me. Um, but I decided to join that society. The acronym is OCSD. Um, and the reason that I ordered, that I, that I joined it was because they did have a space for artists. And I've always loved so many different types of art. I would go to museums, I'd go to black films and foreign films and theater. Um, and of course, seeing different paintings and different mediums of art. Uh, but I was not an artist myself. But what happened uh, one day when I was with CCSD, the Canadian Cultural Society for the Deaf, they had a partnership with Ontario Cultural Society for the Deaf. Um, and They had a launch, uh, a launch party that I attended. And uh, they invited a few special folks and VIPs and things like that to, uh, to share. So in 2019 is when uh, they uh, found somebody who was an amazing director, was a deaf individual themselves. And they wanted to hire, like, I mean, their dream was to, you know, have a partnership with a deaf organization. And then in 2019, they invited me to be part of a workshop to meet other uh, expert artists uh, from other countries who came. So I attended that. And I have to admit, I was very nervous. I wasn't an actor at the time. I love acting, but that wasn't my uh, strong suit. Um, but the, you know, I had the function and the ability to be able to study a script, use that physicality, that movement. Uh, and be able to cognitively understand the process of analyzing a script. And so it wasn't until December of 2018, it was around then, when they offered me a position in the Black Drum, and they offered me a contract. I was really shocked by that. But then as I thought about it, and I wondered, and I decided to go ahead and sign the contract, and away we went in the, uh, in the theater. And that uh, director's name was Mira Zimmerman, and they're from Norway. 
and they have an absolutely incredible reputation and they're also an owner of a deaf theater group in Norway and that has been established for several years. So for them to come to Canada and to be able to provide their skill here was absolutely amazing. Uh, they knew me as an, uh, as an athlete. Is, uh, I am somebody that has ADHD. Um, and so the director was very aware of that and, uh, you know, knew that um, it can be very overwhelming to work with like lights and so on. And, uh, and to make sure like you have to be very patient through the production process to work all day. Um, and that was something that was really, really hard to do. Um, and so they, the director had me like prepared with that. They're like, make sure you bring food or bring books and like you talk to the actors and so on. So was, I had a really hard time training for that. Uh, wasn't my most favorite day, of course. But as we got more into practicing and training, then we finally did the show and it was a two week show. Uh, I invited my family and friends and so on uh to come and check it out because a lot of people didn't believe that i was going to be an actor working in such a professional uh production and so i really fast forwarded into this role uh just to become uh, an actor almost overnight um and so and that's something i'm still doing i'm working on scripts and productions and so on and I didn't, uh, it's, I didn't expect it, but it's become a very great motivation to me and I really love it now. How would you describe yourself as an artist? So I, I think that I describe myself as an artist in, uh, as a book, a book that has several stories to tell. Because I didn't, for a long time, I didn't have the realization as the identity of an artist. Um, you know, I was always creative and I always had an appreciation for art and movies and especially black films and dance styles and all of the different uh, types of arts. I just love that world, world, as well as working with music as much as I can. But there's a big gap in, in black deaf arts. There wasn't very much. And before me, I haven't seen any. But since I was in that production, I've started to see a lot more and a lot of folks who are uh, starting to enter that in, into that field. So I talked to OCSD and CCSD to see if they had any uh, issue with having like BIPOC artists or if they had any kind of uh, database of some kind to like give me history or anything documented about any BIPOC artists. And they didn't have anything at all until the black drum. And so that was a really great start, I think, but it was just too bad that there wasn't anything that was prior to that. So it was quite a long time that those organizations have been around and have not recognized artists of color, but I'm happy to be the first one and to hopefully pave that way for other artists. You've discussed a lot um, about the, about a lot of projects that you've been involved in, particularly that, um, advance the careers of um, deaf artists of color. Can you describe, um, as a deaf artist of color yourself and creator, can you describe some of the obstacles or inaccessibility some of uh, Black artists, uh, Black deaf artists face in the industry today? Okay, so with barriers, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it barriers, but I call it where the gaps are. And the biggest thing is the gaps in representation. Uh, that's something that we're seeing that is uh, a painful truth is in the, you know, in, in theater, it's just automatically white. And the only time that there is black artists in theater is tokenism, just so they can have some colored representation in there. Um, and with deaf organizations, I've always said and encouraged that they should develop something for IBPOC deaf artists um, using deaf interpreters and hearing interpreters, but people of color and developing that theater um, to, to bridge that gap and to work better together, maybe developing like certification or 
or an agency or something to really uplift this community because there isn't anything like it in Canada. So I've thought about it, about, you know, applying for a grant or something like that, because I have, you know, worked in both worlds, the hearing world and the deaf world and attended lots of workshops and education, paid one-on-one -on -one mentorship. And this has helped me develop as an artist, as a black woman. And I really want to reinvest in the success of other artists of color in Canada, because it is a massive, a massive gap. And that gap is what creates a barrier for us. So some of those barriers have been kind of broken down a little bit. But as I mentioned before, working in Wild Seed is great. So being working with Wild Seed is really great. But I'm the only deaf artist, right? So again, I'm the only one. And perhaps in the following years, they'd be more willing to have more deaf folks. If there was two or three or something like that, that'd be really wonderful. And that's a goal. Um, but something that I'm focusing on is the gaps for artists of color and helping them break down, bridge those gaps and break down those barriers. Um, and having that voice and that access is something that is so critical uh, to developing that skill and that representation. Those two things are so key is the skill and the representation. And then everything would, would be really great. Thank you, Courage. What would be your advice to major theater companies that want to work with uh, deaf artists uh, about ensuring of creating opportunities for deaf artists to work, but at the same time ensuring that they are not tokenizing those artists? Okay, the first piece of advice I would say is, is hiring a BIPOC deaf consultant. So for example, like that's a role that I do um, because of my experience and going through so many uh, different barriers and so on. So I have a lot of tools to be able to share, but hiring somebody, um, one or two to, to deliver some training uh, around uh, deaf BIPOC space and how to accommodate them because it's important that uh, for you know BIPOC deaf folks to be involved is to have some training um, to make sure that it's a safe space. My next question would be what are some of your best or most memorable experiences working in um, Canadian theater? Oh boy, okay, here we go. Okay, so 21 Black Futures was definitely the one that was uh, just the best from start to end. That whole journey was wonderful and I was so happy with that work. Um, tears of joy came out of it really. Uh, and it was a dream team that I was working with. It was all black, black interpreters, black actors and directors and so on. And there was just the amount of respect was like beyond being equal, but it just felt good to work with people that were uh, like-minded and similar experiences. So that was the best experience for me. And how do you think um, Black deaf artists have contributed to the Black Lives Matter movement, particularly in the past year and a half during this pandemic, where a lot of people of color have faced discrimination. So uh, I think that social media for sure has been the number one thing for deaf black artists to be able to like uh, a vehicle to support Black Lives Matter. Um, I did set up a group of every Tuesday where there's a group of black deaf folks who get together um, and it's on a weekly basis but that's something that's really helped us be able to do some analysis of self and see how we can really support each other um, so I'm happy that I have that better understanding and that I've been going through uh, what I have been going through and everything that's been happening on social media regarding the Black Lives Matter movement 
is a great way for us to be involved. Um, so we use, you know, as advocates, we use social media the same way. So I think that's been how we've been most involved. And what is your big dream for your artistic career, Courage? Well, I'm really, I'm really happy for uh, today. I have. Uh, I applied for an Obsidian uh, Theater. Oh. So I applied to be part of a, a playwright unit with the Obsidian Theater. Um, and so my dream is to be part of that. Yes, yeah, so they're looking to hire more black artists um, and to develop a play um about growing up and growing up black in canada and the different perspectives on that so they asked me um but there isn't really any other um artists to to ask who are, are black artists that are here and because i have a lot of experience on stage and so on so that's one of my goals and i'm the first one to apply for it um, but to be able to be a part of that would be a dream <laughs>